Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Nathaniel Barry and welcome to my final research presentation titled Repeatability and Machine Learning of Image Features Extracted from FETPET in Application to Post-Surgical Glioblastoma Assessment. It's a bit of a mouthful but it gets the point across and uh, thanks to my supervisor Martin. So glioblastoma is a World Health Organization grade 4 astrocytoma and it's the most common primary brain malignancy in adults with five-year survival rates at just under 10% for those who undergo a maximal tumor resection followed by radiotherapy with concomitant and adjuvant temozolomide. It's primarily imaged using structural MRI with contrast enhancement on T1 weighted MRI often suspicious of glioma, but this tends to suffer from low specificity in identifying non-neoplastic lesions. So within the last two decades, FETPET has gained a large amount of popularity due to its long half-life, not requiring um, not requiring an on-site cyclotron, um, and also its uptake within the brain not requiring disruption of the blood-brain barrier. It has superior tumor to background contrast to FDG. An example of this is, is shown here. This is an FDG PET image, and this is a FET PET image, and hopefully you can see that the uptake within the background is basically night and day between these two images, and the hotspot is so easily identifiable in FET PET. A 200 megabecquerel administration um, translates to roughly a 3.3 millisievert whole body effective dose to the patient, which is quite reasonable. So what is the clinical benefit of FET PET? So in 2016, the World Health Organization updated their guidelines for, tumor, uh, for glioma typing. This included molecular markers such as the IDH mutation status and 1P19Q co-deletion status. Conventional FET PET parameters are able to significantly differentiate between IDH mutated gliomas up here and IDH wild type gliomas. But when we get down to these more specific glioma subtypes here in red, um, it's differentiated by the 1P19Q co-deletion status, it tends to struggle doing that significantly. For surgical biopsy guidance and treatment planning, FET volumes tend to encapsulate MRI volumes in a much larger, offering complementary information with tumor recurrence having better congruence with FET volumes. But most importantly, a hotspot on FET PET is able to find really good um, locations for a biopsy. An example of this is from a really recent biopsy study here. I might need to <laughs> come over here. So on the top row, we have a biopsy location taken that has contrast enhancement on MRI and also is positive for FET uptake, which showed um, glioma tissue upon analysis here. And then on the middle row, we no longer have that contrast enhancement on MRI, but we have this positive FET uptake still, and that still showed uh, glioma tissue. And now we have a sort of a test to see whether if we take a biopsy location without contrast enhancement on MRI and also without FET uptake, but which is within uh, abnormal signal on T2 flare, what do we get? And it seemed to show uh, mostly um, normal healthy brain tissue with minimal tumor cell infiltration. For prognostication, multiple studies have demonstrated FET imaging features as prognostic of patient outcomes. In general, uh, high biological tumor volume and high maximum mean tumor to background ratio for static features and short time to peak and negative slope for dynamic features are predictive of poor patient outcomes. Here we have a patient with a short time to peak and a patient with a later time to peak. And using cutoff analysis, we can significantly stratify patients based on outcomes such as progress-free survival and overall survival. So most importantly, um, FETPET is able to differentiate treatment-related changes from tumor recurrence. So typically, contrast enhancement on MRI, MRI requires a disruption of the blood-brain barrier, which is usually caused by rapid cell proliferation from an aggressive tumor. This can cause uh, mimicking on MRI since treatment-related related effects can also cause a disruption of the blood-brain barrier, such as surgery and radiotherapy. And so this has been termed as pseudo-progression in the literature, um, which can cause effective treatment to be halted, which we really don't want for high-mortality cancers. An example of pseudo-progression is shown here. So this is an early post-operative MRI showing a residual contrast enhancement, which is the red arrow there. The patient's undergone radiochemotherapy, and at the eight-week mark, that residual contrast enhancement has remained, so it looks like recurrence. But on FET-PET, in the same location, there's no increased uptake at all. Further down the line, at 16 months, that residual enhancement has gone away by itself, so this was a case of pseudo-progression. And so you can see how we can use FET-PET to differentiate that. Um, even more com in a complex situation, a patient who has recurrence can be given anti-angiogenic drugs, and this can cause a pseudo-response to treatment rather than pseudo-progression. We have to differentiate that as well. So in parallel, the field of radiomics has developed, which is the high throughput extraction of quantitative features from medical images, allowing us to extract hundreds to thousands of images per patient. It's suspected that textual features may quantify spatial and temporal tumor heterogeneity that methods like a biopsy can't. So this is a typical radiomics workflow shown in this figure here. 
but you can see here that there's a large number of factors that can affect um, the extraction of these features up until that extraction point. So that leads to repeatability and reproducibility in the field of radiomics. So prognostic features must be robust to multiple factors up until the extraction point if we want these to be translated into a clinical setting. For our predictive modeling, we want to reduce complexity and increase interpretability of our results. This figures from the calculation of the radiomics quality score, which is basically an evaluation criteria and guideline for researchers to create reproducible radiomics studies. I'd like to highlight here that the radiomics quality score requires researchers to report features that are robust to imaging at multiple time points for our feature stability here. And for predictive modeling, we have to do some form of uh, feature selection over here to reduce overfitting and model complexity, and also some form of validation, whether it be resampling techniques such as cross-validation and bootstrapping, or even better yet, an independent test set. So these have gone into the two aims here for my thesis. So aim A is a repeatability analysis. So FET-PET radionic features are increasingly used in glioma studies, and so we therefore found it necessary to assess whether FET-PET radionic features are robust imaging at multiple time, time points, which we can assess using test-retest imaging here. Um, importantly, this is a novel approach within the literature currently. And now for predictive modeling, we wanted to stratify patients into low and high risk groups based on overall survival. This creates a binary classification task. And we want to apply machine learning with the robust features we found from our first aim. And we want to see if a feature is robust, is it also going to be predictive of a patient outcome? So here's our patient cohort. Um, this came from a fetin glioma prospective imaging cohort study, which recruited patients from 2014 to 2017. And we ended up with 24 patients with histologically confirmed glioblastoma multiform. Every patient underwent a baseline post-surgical FET-PET scan before they underwent uh, radiochemotherapy, and nine of those patients had a retest scan uh, around about one week later. So those nine patients with their test and retest scan constitute the, aim for our, uh, constitute the data for our first aim. And then again, taking that baseline scan and then looking at follow-up data, um, such as overall survival, uh, constitutes the data for our secondary aim. So on the left is a summary of the image protocol used. It's just important to be transparent about these things, especially in radiomics. Um, but more importantly, I wanted to run everyone through how we do the segmentation of the volume for the extraction process. So here we have um, a crescent-shaped uh, volume of interest placed in the contralateral normal brain, passing through white and gray matter. And taking the mean of this gives our background assessment. A spherical volume of interest is placed um, centered on our suspected tumor volume. And then every... Uh, sort of voxel within this, uh, tumor, uh, within this um, volume of interest. We calculate a tumor to background ratio. So here, tumor to background ratio. And then we do a segmentation, um, a threshold-based segmentation using a tumor to background ratio 1.6 to get this final volume. And with reference, this is adjusted with reference to the patient's MRI to remove any obvious non-tumor structures. This um, threshold has also been validated histologically within the literature. So time to strap in for this part. Um, we have our volume of interest up here. We need to convert this from the RT-Struct DICOM format to a binary mask. And then we have our binary mask and our PET image, and we need to really need to re resample that to isotropic voxel spacing to extract rotationally invariant features. We undergo the feature extraction process using the Pi Radiomics open source software, which follows the image biomarker standardization initiative. And each image must undergo a grade level discretization, which hopefully can sort of see that illustrated there. And on the original image, we do this using four different fixed spin widths in uh, terms of SUV. We extract shape features, which are basic mor morphological features, such as volume and surface area. First order features, which include statistics, such as mean and median or interquartile range, and also histogram bin features. And then, more importantly, the textual features, which take into account neighboring voxels and their intensities. We also extract features after we've applied these following filters, but only using that single bin width of 0.1 SUV only to simplify that analysis. So you may, you may be wondering, how do we define a feature to be repeatable? So we turn to the interclass correlation, uh, um, interclass correlation coefficient using a one-way random effects model. Um, an ICC of one is, demonstrates perfect repeatability. Um, but for our analysis, we define a robust feature to have an ICC greater than or equal to 0.85. And so then we do our analysis. Then moving on to our secondary aim, we have our robust features here. They undergo, undergo z-score normalization to prevent certain features from having a greater weight in uh, classifiers. And then we do a final, final feature selection, uh, restricting the final number of features to three. 
every model we evaluate using a leave on our cross validation, which is um, briefly summarized there. And for every um, run through of this, we calculate an area under the receiver operator characteristic curve. And so the model with the highest AUC is going to be our best performing model. So jumping into the results of the first aim, we had one patient which was reconstructed differently and was excluded from further analysis. In total, I extracted 1,578 features uh, per patient. And on the original image, we found that 55.7% of features were stable and shaven first order features exhibited the highest percentages of repeatability. On the filtered images, 57.3% of features were stable, but this doesn't give us a good look into the individual filters themselves, which I will go through shortly. And so this might be a lot to take in, but um, this is sort of the in-depth analysis I did on just features extracted from the original image across these four different bin widths. On the x-axis, we have the ICC values I just discussed, and on the y-axis, we have our features which have been extracted from the gray level size and matrix in this case. So these are all textual features. Each dot represents a calculated ICC value alongside their 95% confidence interval. Here we have um, this dotted line here, which is our threshold for stability. So that's the 0.85 mark I talked about. And any dot above that, we can clearly see is stable according to our actual our definition. And so to have a look at the impact of bin width on feature stability, um, I generated this nice looking Venn diagram. And what this tells me is that 55 of the features I extracted from the original image were um, stable regardless of the bin width I chose. And there's a minimal amount of features that fall out of this um, maximal intersection. So it seems to be there's a minimal impact. So looking at the filters now, um, this is uh, some general box plots. On the x-axis, we have our filters alongside our original here for um, comparison. And on the y-axis, we have our ICC values. Each box plot represents um, the distribution of the ICC values with the respective filter. And so those marked in green significantly increased um, stability of features or the ICC values of features across the board. And those marked in red significantly decreased ICC values across the board. So we'd want to avoid those. So looking at how does each filter affect the number of stable features. So on the x-axis we have um, our filters again and on the y-axis we have residual stable features. And this is sort of my invention, uh, what I like to call residual stable features is a comparison between the number of features we define to be stable on the original image and the number of features we've defined to be stable when we apply a filter. So just an ex as an example, we have the lapellation of Gaussian filter on the right here with a sigma equal to five millimeters. And then th what this bar chart is telling me is that after we apply this filter, we gain around about 20 additional uh, features that have gone above that um, threshold for stability. So this filter is pushing 20 of those features above that ICC equal to 0.85. Um, these results are largely consistent with a 2017 systematic review of repeatability and reproducibility studies and then recent glioma studies after that. Um, I, d I decided to analyze or look at an analyzing with different bin widths, but there's another image discretization method using bin counts. But bin widths have been shown in the literature to have better reproducibility and also they normalize the intensity resolution across images with different SUV ranges. So it's a bit more appropriate when we're imaging at multiple time points. Um, for future radiomic studies, you should probably avo uh, avoid these ones in the middle of these filters. They tend to not do too much for repeatability, and they're generally not prognostic in the literature in any other application. But the biggest drawback is our lack of data. So having eight patients with test-retest imaging is basically the bare minimum for any repeatability study. And so future studies are warranted with cohorts of maybe 20 to 30 patients, if possible, just to validate the results in this study. But I tried to be as transparent as possible and uh, report any confidence interval wherever I could. Um, as another note, voxel resampling had, may have had a non-negligible impact on results. Certain features may be particularly sensitive to that resampling process, and I haven't um, addressed that in um, my analysis, but I just wanted to make a note of it. Uh, we define a feature to be stable using an ICC greater than or equal to 0.85, but a better um, definition may have been to take into account the confidence intervals maybe using a confidence interval between 0.91 and 1.0, maybe been a better assessment, and it may, in hindsight, have been a bit more consistent with the literature. And finally, an integrated repeatability study with multiple delineators is necessary moving forward. This has been demonstrated in FTG PET. Uh, here we have five observers that are manually delineating a tumor volume, and they just ha had a look at the correlation between uh, features that were stable to inter-observer variability and also stable to test-retest imaging. And generally they were, so that's good to see. Now moving on to the results of part B, um, 
we define overall survival as the date at which the patient has their first surgery up until um, the date of their death or since the uh, end of study day. We assess the mean overall survival using a kaplan meier survival curve here to take into account these three sensor data points. On the x-axis, we have uh, overall survival in days, and on the y-axis, we have survival probability. So when this uh, survival curve crosses this 50% point of survival probability, that gives us our mean overall survival, which was 468 days. And this is also shows the 95% confidence interval there. This stratified 11 patients into our high-risk group and 12 patients into our low-risk group. And the benefit of doing this um, stratification is that we don't have a class imbalance for our machine learning process. So for our model building, we looked at five feature selection methods, two univariate filter methods using the F-score of mutual information, and then recursive feature elimination using a linear support vector machine, extreme gradient boosting uh, tree, and a random forest. What recursive feature elimination does is recursively go through all of our features and finds the best subset of those features that are assigned the greatest weight in these classifiers. Every feature we get from one of these methods, we run through six of these classifiers, and so in total we uh, looked at 30 different models. So this is just a summary of the features that were selected using each method, and uh, the filters that we see, to crop, see crop up is usually just the log and wavelet filters, and also the type of features are first order and textual features only. So those shape features I was talking about didn't make it through this process at all. So our best performing model, uh, it came from features from a uh, recursive feature elimination using a linear support vector machine. This has one log textual feature, one wavelet first order feature, and one wavelet textual feature. So it's a good sign to see that these features are pretty distinct from each other. Um, when we put this into our best performing classifier, linear discriminant analysis, undergoes leaving out cross validation, which gave us an accuracy of 87%, a sensitivity of 100%, and a specificity of 78.6%, with an AUC of 0.879. Um, that's really good performance, considering an AUC of one is a perfect classifier. But this looks really good, but I'm going to tell you why it's not good. <laughs> okay. um, so for a discussion, uh, we found features were predictive regardless of reinjection, repositioning, and physiological change in the patient, which is pretty significant. That was my main goal. Uh, we only used uh, three features to reduce overfitting and model complexity, as I said earlier, and that increases the interpretability of the results. Since we um, did f uh, our feature selection on our data and then also cross-validate on that same data, those results you saw are going to be optimistically biased. And so we require an independent test set to assess model generalizability to data I haven't seen. But due to the lack of data we had, I wanted to train on everything and try and get that assessment. Um, and we just couldn't, we didn't have the data available to have an independent test set. Future work should probably, in my opinion, focus on automated machine learning pipelines, such as the Teapot Data Science Assistant and NVIDIA's Clara with its federated learning. So to conclude, we assessed FetPet feature robustness to test, retest imaging and glioblastoma patients. We found that bin width had a minimal impact on repeatable features. Shape and first order features exhibited the highest repeatability followed by textual features, which is consistent with the literature. And these wavelet and all the log filters increased feature repeatability. For our secondary conclusion, we found three FetPet features which were predictive of patients stratified into our low and high risk groups based on their mean overall survival. And we uh, were able to identify our best performing classifier there. And so finally, this is my sort of optimistic look of how we can incorporate a radiomics model into the clinical workflow and management of a glioblastoma or high grade glioma patient. This is sort of generated from my two years worth of experience in the masters. So up here we have our patient going in for their hybrid uh, FET-PET MRI scan. They undergo their pre-surgical scan. They go through an automatic segmentation pipeline. We do our feature extraction, and then these are clinically validated features with a lot of literature to back it up. We have all of these um, characteristics which may be unique to the patient, and then we can generate our personalized radiomics model. So I want to stress that this is meant to be used as a decision support system for clinicians, and with the clinicians always making the final decision. We can then possibly do a non-invasive glioma typing, so we can figure out what the glioma grade or any molecular subtypes without the need for going in for a biopsy and it's related morbidity. And then the patient will undergo some uh, surgery, and then we go through this loop again for the post-surgical imaging, come through here. We do our risk assessment, which may be similar to what I showed in my secondary aim, where you might um, stratify patients into risk groups. And then a clinician will make a treatment recommendation they'll undergo most likely some form of radiochemotherapy, and then they'll have their post-treatment 
follow-up imaging, go through this again, and then we have to differentiate the treatment-related changes from tumor recurrence, as I said earlier. So they may have a tumor, they may have a recurrence, and they have to go through this loop again. But hopefully, we get to this effective treatment, which has been personalised to the patient. So thanks for watching. Um, no, just based on mean overall survival. Yeah, because the average overall survival is quite different for mm. each one of those patients. So with, what, eight or nine patients? Um, that, so the, the secondary part had 23 patients. Mm. It may be a little bit skewed because your overall power for individual sort of the molecular subtypes may be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. yeah. So from what I can remember of the patient cohort, they were mostly IDH wild type. Yeah. Um, with some, some not specified, I think, or maybe one not specified, and then the rest mutated. I think maybe three or two or three mutated. But yes, it's a bit oversimplified just to assess if these features could be pro prognostic. It was mainly to get to a binary classification, but that can be definitely resolved into a more um, clinically appropriate solution. Sure, that's great. Thank you for that. It's always good to see you. Here's a, a bit more better insight to clinically. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, Sorry, I'll come over here. Uh, that's okay. I apologize if you covered this, but um, could you just give a brief, brief rundown of the software packages that you use throughout your process? Yeah, I could, I could talk for a while. But <laughs> <laughs> brief. Um, so, pyradiomics, when, so I said that pyradiomics um, follows the image biomarker standardization initiative. So I glossed over that, but that's a pretty big like, part of it. So that basically is a guideline for how to do image pre-processing and reporting that in your studies. And then also, specifically mathematically, defines the names of the features um, so that when a bunch of different studies use them, they can all be the same. You can have a feature that is named the same between two different studies, and they could be calculated in completely different ways. So that's for a bit of reproducibility, so that's why I chose it. So PyRadiomics is open source, um, uses Python. And you basically have to convert your images to 3D object files, such as nearly raw raster data or nifty files. And then you need to get a binary mask that has the, that's in the right location. And then you can customize the extraction using any different sort of filters, as I showed, anything you want like that. You can just do a smaller subset of features if you want to. And then it will extract all of that. And you can, it'll provide a dictionary of all those extractions. And then you can export that. Um, yourself to an Excel file, and that's what I did. And then brought that Excel file into R, where I had to do my repeatability analysis and then bring it back into Python, and so it was all over the place. Um, so well, every figure is from Python um, using matplotlib, and there's that Venn diagram is from a very specific package, so that is built on matplotlib, but um, yeah, just a bit higher order. Everything except the, this. Survival curve. That's from R. So R, I, I'm not a big, the biggest fan of how R's sort of figures look. So I went to um, Python, and that allowed me to do this sort of. It's that was pretty um, hard to make. So um, that required a bit more of um, an in-depth use of Python than I think R could offer. Yeah. No worries. Yeah, so the, the model you Yeah. So if you were to combine like dynamic features and MRI features as well, do you, is it a reason to think you'll get a more powerful model? Well, M yes, definitely MRI has uh, already demonstrated um, its predictive power. And since um, the, the recommendation is that FETBET should be used in complement to MRI, I'd assume that future radiomic studies should be bringing together MRI and FETPET, and I believe I think I, you would hope that there would be a balance of FETPET and MRI features, but um, I'm not too sure. For the dynamic data, for incorporating dynamic data, there was a voxel-wise um, analysis that was recently published in this year, I think, where they calculated uh, metrics such as the tumor to background ratio and also the dynamic uh, features such as time to peak and slope. 
and they did it on a voxel-wise basis. So what I ran into when it, well, I was originally trying to do dynamic features is, or extraction on dynamic data is I couldn't find a methodology or any software to do any sort of a 4D, oh, 4D extraction on a 4D data set. So um, that offers a way to encompass the dynamic data onto a voxel-wise basis. Now you have a 3D volume and we can extract features from that. And that may be quite predictive because that, that shows, I was going to put on here, but due to time, I couldn't. But they produce some pretty nice um, maps, which may be predictive or even more predictive. So that's a way to incorporate uh, the dynamic data. Yep. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> this one. <laughs> yeah. Did you make this slide or you copied it? No, nah, I made it. That's all my brain. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's some of the... <laughs> Yeah, so um, Anna's given some comments, and we're still waiting on Roz to give some comments there. Yeah. Also, big thanks to both Martin and Pedgman for facilitating and allowing me to grow as a researcher. So, and the other thing with Natalia is it's helping a lot that I get to run collaboration with you. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, from Zoom, do you have any questions? All good, happy? Thanks very much again. Yep, no worries. Thank you.